Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney. Uh, the, the senator that everybody was praising and jumping up and down for because he, he marched with Black Lives Matter protesters. He marched with them. You know, the, the same thing when, they, when they're, they're praising Liz Cheney for reading text messages. You know, we're, we're really quick to absolve a Republican. But Mitt <laughs> Romney gave a speech yesterday, and he is comparing President Joe Biden to President Trump because President Joe Biden wants voting rights. Listen to Black Lives Matter marcher Mitt Romney. Listen to this. The goal of some Republicans is to, quote, turn the will of the voters into a mere suggestion. And so President Biden goes down the same tragic road taken by President Trump, casting doubt on the reliability of American elections. This is a sad, sad day. I expected more of President Biden, who came into office with the stated goal of bringing the country together. Keith, uh, I never liked Mitt Romney. That's I was a never bad, a fan. That speech. You know? <laughs> That's, it's, that, that, that was just disingenuous at its best. Come on, man. He know he knows exactly what he's talking about. That has that has absolutely nothing to do with those two things have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Donald Trump engaged in a coordinated campaign to delegitimize the 2016 election and the 2020 election. Joe Biden has done no such thing. All he's done is call for legislation to make it fairer and easier for people to vote. The idea that Mitt Romney would try to equate those two shows exactly what kind of bullshit yeah. he engaged in the first place. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can say that word on, on your on your. Look, you can say whatever you want. Let it out. It shows you exactly the type of sophistry that he's engaged with in the beginning. So we'll use a more sophisticated word to say the same thing. But he, he was never really serious about it being inclusive in the first place. The fact that he took one semi-courageous semi vote uh, to impeach Donald Trump doesn't make, doesn't absolve him of all the other wrong things that he's done. And he continues to be a disappointment. He, even after, even after he criticized Trump in the 2016 election, there he was sitting with Trump, having dinner with him, uh, accepting an invitation to, to go work for Trump. The, the, the guy has no consistency whatsoever and he can't be trusted. You know, here's the thing, and both y'all kind of alluded to this. You know, I'm not one to say that uh, all the bad things happen on the Republican Party because of Trump. I don't believe that. I believe that Trump is the hate that Republicans created. But as much as I despise Ronald Reagan, I can't. I think Ronald Reagan was actually more destructive than Trump. But he did reauthorize the Voting Rights Act in his first term. He, he did that. Now, this is welfare queen. This is states' rights, Ronald Reagan. But that said, he did reauthorize that Voting Rights Act. Now, of course, seven years later, he would try to veto a Civil Rights Act, whatever. But the Voting Rights Act, he did reauthorize. Uh, even like you said, uh, Keith, under, under uh, President George, uh, George W. Bush, he did sign the Voting Rights Act. Is it as simple that the black president, that, like, what is... What has happened when even I would say Ronald Reagan was a racist? I would most definitely say that President George Bush was a racist. What happened with Republican racism that has gone as far that they won't even have the cover, the cover of, well, at least we'll sign this damn Voting Rights Act. We might get affirmative action. We might put horrific appointees to, to the, to the uh, Supreme Court. We might do all this, but, you know, we're going to do some basic things like voting rights. OK, fine. What happened? Amisha, then Keith, what, what, what do you think happened? Their voters, their audience, their base got a lot more vigilant and dug in on their racism loudly and proudly. Um, racism has always been and white supremacy has always been a part of the American psyche and a part of the American culture. But what we've seen over the past few years is it basically become the, the Goliath of the United States to the point where our democracy is uh, only a mirror of its former self. Now, we never had a perfect democracy to begin with, but I think that at this point, People across the globe and other foreign leaders are wondering what the hell is going on with the United States of America. And because Republican voters love that rhetoric around um, who's allowed to access, who isn't allowed to access the vote. They don't want black people. They don't want brown people. They don't want younger voters. They don't want um, a lot of women. There, there are a lot of people who they do not want to vote, indigent populations. They are dug in because their base swallows it up. 
I think that what we've seen is Republicans get a lot, Republican voters get a lot more bold in their anti-civil rights aggression over the past few years to where it's actually honestly taken us back to that Jim Crow era. And that's something that, you know, even though I agree with you 100%, Reagan was a horrible person and he definitely didn't give a damn about black people. Um, he was somebody in many ways that was smarter in how he chose to codify and talk about it than Donald Trump happened to be. And he was also someone who understood how to do policy that would be detrimental to black people for generations to come. Um, in, in that vein, we saw the split during the Obama administration and the rise of the Tea Party, which was our first signal that these crazies weren't going to go away. The Tea Party didn't just dissolve. They got louder and prouder and they changed their name and they changed their face. Now they're the face of white vigilantism. Now they're the face of this obstruction. Now they're the face of those who are spreading anti-vaccine rhetoric. Now they're the face of those who are, you know, cheering on having kids in cages and separated from their parents. They're the people who are pushing anti-CRT. I think that we have to wrap our heads around the fact that many of these individuals have always been there, but they were having these conversations in their own silos and groups. And now they're having them across openly across all forms of social media. They are willing to kidnap or attempt to kidnap a, a sitting governor. They're willing to attempt to, you know, not only attempt to, but storm the Capitol, attempt to um, attempt to assassinate the vice president, the sitting vice president at the time and Mike Pence. They have been emboldened. And I think that Trump obviously did that, but it started long before him. They have been emboldened by the Republican Party. And now the Republican Party doesn't need to say these things in an undercoded or coded language. They can do the dog whistles out loud and there is no shaming and blaming that's going to stop them. That's just where I think the American public is right now when it comes to conservative voters. The voters and what they see and what they expect has changed because they've been a lot more hypervigilant racist than we've seen in the most recent eras. And I'm sorry, I, I forgot to add, I wanna add really quick. Uh, Richard Nixon also signed the Voting Rights Act in 1970. Trifling Richard Nixon <laughs> signed the Voting Rights Act in 1970. Go ahead, Keith. Well, you make the point I was gonna make, which is that every Republican president has supported the Voting Rights Act until Donald Trump. Every Republican president has supported the Voting Rights Act until Donald Trump. Now, this means two things. First, it means that the Republican party has recognized some, something different in the Trump era than it did before. And that was, they determined that there was no longer a political cost to be paid in being mm -hmm. overtly racist. But the other thing it means is that, as Amisha was mentioning before, that the Republican Party historically has had a history of racism since the 1960s. And all oh, yeah. of the sort of the, 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 the talk hasn't been followed up with action in the sense of, of actually being believing in believing what they were saying. So what we've had is they've been giving lip service by signing this legislation, by in, endorsing the, the sort of mainstream agenda. They go talk to the NAACP. You know, Donald Trump was the first president not to talk to the NAACP in 100 years. Um, and 100 years. 100 years, yes. I didn't know and, it was 100. Yeah, 100 years. And, and so they, they've known that this un undercurrent of racism has existed in the Republican Party since the 1960s when Lyndon, when, um, when Barry Goldwater was nominated as the, as the Republican mm -hmm. Party nominee in 64. But they've kept it underground. Donald Trump allowed it to come above ground. And they were, that was something that frightened them. Even in 2016, they were, you know, in 2015, when Trump announced his campaign, almost every Republican condemned him because they oh, knew. Yeah. They thought it was going to be a disaster. What they didn't realize is that this is exactly what their base had been wanting from the beginning, and that it wasn't going to be a disaster for them. There would be no political cost for them to do this. And so the Republican Party changed after Trump and became overtly racist. And they said, well, it doesn't matter anymore. We can win. We don't need black people. We don't need brown people. We just need, we just need our, our white supremacist base to come up and, and, and support us. And there's no political cost to be paid for doing that. Uh, I want to now I want to go over to Biden. So Biden gave the speech yesterday in uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I talked I talked about it a little bit yesterday as well, uh, but he hadn't given the speech yet. So here's a clip of Biden saying that he's tired of being silent about voting rights. Listen to this. It's also time to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act.
I've been having these quiet conversations with the members of Congress for the last two months. I'm tired of being quiet. <laughs> Folks, it'll restore the strength of the Voting Rights Act of 65, the one President Johnson signed after John Lewis was beaten, nearly killed on Bloody Sunday, only to have the Supreme Court weakened in multiple times over the past decade. Restoring the Voting Rights Act would mean the Justice Department can stop discriminatory laws before they go into effect. Before they go into effect. Okay. <laughs> Keith, let me ask you this. And you obviously, this is just hypothetical. You worked in the Clinton White House. <clears throat> If President Bill Clinton was facing the same kind of crisis with the Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. and Congress was gridlocked, do you think that he would have, how do you think he would have been different? Or do you think he would have been doing exactly what President Joe Biden is doing? I'm curious to know, as somebody who worked in the Clinton White House, how, how would he have handled gridlock? And we all know he passed that Welfare Reform Act. We all know he passed that, that crime reform bill, which I had some good things in it, but not, not enough. But how do you think Clinton would have did this, would have handled this differently? I'm curious to know. Because Clinton wasn't as nice as Biden and Obama. Well, I, I think I know where you're going, what you think I'm going to say, but I actually probably am going to say something different. I don't think Clinton would have done much, any, much of anything different, to be honest. Um, mm. I think, you know, Clinton began the politics of triangulation in the Democratic Party. And he, he also was the first president to face sort of the, the massive resistance from the Republican Party uh, in a sense of um, Newt Gingrich and the contract with contract in America and so forth. Um, I, you know, Bill Clinton capitulated. Bill Clinton gave that, that famous speech where he said the era of big government is over and State of the Union address. Um, mm. Bill Clinton um, came in as a as a optimistic liberal and left as a compromise moderate. And mm. um, I, I don't think that his, his administration would have been any more effective, nor do I think Obama's administration would have been any more effective, which I think is the problem with the, with the, the whole Democratic Party. The, the past three Democratic presidents, um, neither one, any, neither of them, any of the three of them, haven't been very effective in terms of pushing that agenda, the progressive left-wing agenda, um, they've been more effective, I think, in sort of pushing this sort of narrative of a, of a united America. And I don't think that that's possible at this point, as divided <laughs> as the country has been. And I'm, I'm more aligned with two other presidents. And one of, one of them, they're both racist, by the way. One is FDR and the other is LBJ. But <laughs> FDR openly said, you know, that my, my opponents, they, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. And, and I like that kind of spirit. You know, I, won't, I didn't mention Harry Truman, but Harry Truman used to go around campaigning and, his, and, he would, and they would say, give him hell, Harry. And Harry would say, I'm just telling the truth. And they think it's hell. Then Lyndon Johnson, when he, when he was president, you know, he would take people, he, you know, he was a former majority leader in the Senate, so he knew how to sort of twist arms. He would take them and talk to them and negotiate with them and get them, you know, I'll give you this bridge or I won't give you this bridge if you do what I want or don't do what I want. That's what I want to see in the president of the United States. You know, I, I don't want a bunch of speeches. I want a president who's going to go out there and make things happen. Even if you have to shut everything down to make it happen. If this is the fundamental existential issue for the survival of democracy and potentially the survival of your presidency and your party, then for God's sake, act like it is. Do something. Mm. Don't just talk about it. Who, who the hell cares if two, two senators in your own party are obstructionists to it? Push them. Push them publicly. Even if it pushes them away, make everybody come on, come out and say exactly where they stand on this issue on the record. Demand a floor vote in the United States Senate. Let people be held accountable. That's what I'm saying. I, I'd like to see that kind of activism from the leadership of the Democratic Party, not this kind of namby pamby. Oh well, we're going to try to get everybody to work to work together. Who cares about that? People want results. They don't want this inclusivity that doesn't accomplish anything. Keith, I, I well, I know why you won't run for office. I know why you won't. <laughs> you just don't want to do it. But we need a voice like that in Congress. Yeah, Amisha, what are your thoughts on 
Biden. And, and again, let me just say this, because folks were, were tweeting me a little bit upset yesterday. I understand what Biden has in Congress. I understand Biden can't control Joe, Man- Joe, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. I totally get that. So I, I'm, we're all aware of that, what Biden has in Congress. Go ahead, Amisha. So um, first of all, I'm going to credit Keith Boykin with being our resident historian. Um, <laughs> and I think that when we, th- when we think about this in context, we have to look at Joe Biden as somebody who has elevated moral victory over actual victory. At the end of the day, history is not going to look upon you because you gave great, uh, great speeches that you know were said in the vein of our, our civil rights leaders, many of them who were slain. History is going to look upon you to say, did you get this done? Did you meet the moment or did you not? And I think that he has to be able to structurally figure out a way to meet that moment and advance his, his, his priorities if voting rights is actually a priority for him. And I will say this, we've seen time after time again, and he mentioned it in his speeches yesterday, um, that you know he voted to reauthorize, he voted to reauthorize, he brought some people on board to reauthorize. With that being said, we are not in that um, you know hunky-dory, bring everybody across the table together and have that conversation. You're gonna get Republicans on your side as he was then, even even the conversations he's talked about having with segregationists. It tells us where America is in 2022 when segregationists in the 60s, 70s were able, to, segregationists in the 50s were able to say, okay, um, by the time Voting Rights Act came around, they were willing to vote, to reauthorize. It says something that re- those same Republicans who have you know innate racist tendencies do not make that same notion today. I think that it, to Keith's point earlier, it says exactly that they are they are open to saying the racist part out loud, being flamboyant about it because there's no there's no detriment to them whatsoever. This whole post-racial society that many people believe we had ushered in after Barack Obama was elected twice was basically a lie. Um, the idea that the soul of America, the battle for the soul of America, I hated that rhetoric from the time it started. The soul of America is white supremacy. The soul of America is racism. The soul of America mm. is believing that black people are not to be treated humanely. The soul of America is not giving a damn about the poor. I, I, I think that at the end of the day, mm. we have to be very real about what the soul of America is because the battle for that soul, we need to cast that aside and develop a new soul anyway. Um, it, it is that this is a president who has to do, and I love the LBJ comparison, he has to be willing to put it all on the line because democracy is at stake. The presidency is at stake. Right now, 2024 ain't looking too good. And we already know how the midterms are going to go. But the other thing is that the Democratic Party is at stake. They run on being this big tent party of liberals when in all honesty, the coalition that continues to play out for them is black people. That coalition is different color gradients of black. It is what it is. So if you're not able to come through for black people, the whole Democratic Party is going to fall apart. If black people don't have access to the ballot, it's going to fall apart. If the promises that Joe Biden made to black people do not come to fruition, it is going to fall apart. He does have some elements at his disposal. So just saying cinema and mansion and using that as basically the the wherewithal that is killing everything is quite frankly frustrating because yes, he does have some issues in this in this Senate and within his own flank. But with that being said, there are still elements at his disposal that he could use. If it means shutting everything down, if it means forcing forcing the hands of not only them, but the Republican Party as well, because they damn sure do it when Democrats are in office, then do that. I think that he's still holding on to this idea of bipartisanship because he had been in the Senate for so long and he believes that he can somehow structure and make this happen. That's why he waited so long to have the speech he did yesterday. A year and a half ago, civil rights leaders were asking him for that speech. A year and a half ago, they said the things that need to be said in that speech. He finally came to fruition with, after Build Back Better failed and after he recognized that this bipartisanship he's been dancing around is not going to happen. Uh, a little bit of news here. Uh, Mitch McConnell just spoke out about Joe Biden's speech on voting rights, and Mitch McConnell called it. <laughs> Mitch McConnell said, I did not recognize the man at that podium yesterday. Oh my God. See, this is, this is important. This is- well, well, hold up, hold up, Keith. He also added, it was profoundly unpresidential. After everything that he sat through while well, Donald Trump did for four years now, exactly. he has a nerve to call it unpresidential because Donald Trump sat there and said that the, the, the Democrats are enemies of the people, that the press are enemies of the people. He was attacking Colin Kaepernick because he took a knee on a football field. And you're worried because Joe Biden gives a speech demanding or asking we pass a bill, pass a bill named after John Lewis for voting rights? 
That shows you the, the hypocrisy of the Republican Party, and it shows you exactly why Joe Biden is ill-advised to pursue this bipartisan route and try to pretend like everybody, everything's the same as it used to be. We can all get along. We can't. The Republicans are fighting total war against democracy, and it is our obligation to fight against them. I'm going to go back to what Amisha said real quickly, where she said that, that Joe Biden shouldn't use this language about the, the soul of the America, fight for the soul of America. I don't really like that language either, but I'll tell you what, if it is truly a fight for the soul of America and you believe it, then God damn it, get in there and fight like it is. Don't pussyfoot around, act like it's a real fight and get in there and do it. Do the battle. Don't just give a speech. Go there and go, go to Congress, go to the mat and do what you can to make things happen.